Assalamu alaikum friends, this is Nadir Shah in Chicago and you are watching my channel, Knowledge for Quality of Life. Friends, last time uh, we looked at uh, the vitamin D relationship with cardiovascular and today we are going to talk a little bit about um, concept of uh, insulin resistance in particularly looking at the diabetes, how vitamin D is uh, related in management of diabetes and you know for the onset of diabetes with the vitamin d deficiency now if you remember from my previous vlogs that which we talked about uh that we have various uh cells throughout our body and each and every cell uh in our system which com controls different metabolic functions uh nature has wired vitamin d receptors unto them. And they crave for vitamin D raw material for the proper functionality and, and proper uh, metabolism of all the cellular functions. Now, similarly here, mm -hmm. uh, when we are talking about hormone insulin, which is produced by our pancreas via beta cells. Now, these beta cells uh, in our pancreas has a VDR attached to it. So basically beta cells crave for vitamin D over time. And for the proper functionality of the beta cells in regulating the insulin and you know uh, nullifying the excess blood sugar when we eat. The way it works that when we eat food, that food converts into glucose. Uh, and that glucose, excess glucose, which gets converted from sugar, which we eat in the form of food, needs to go into the cells to make it as a store as an energy. Now, when blood senses that, you know, we have an excess sugar uh, and pancreas receives the message through via beta cells, beta cells releases the insulin and insulin comes to the blood sugar rescue and sends to the cells in the to store in the form of energy. Now, if somehow, these beta cells are deprived of vitamin D over a long time, a person before he or she declares diabetic, that person will remain probably borderline pre-diabetic or pre-diabetic for a long time without knowing that, you know, what condition the person is in. When you have excess blood sugar and your doctor tests you that you are above 120 milligram per deciliter, uh, which is a threshold for, you know, a pre-diabetes condition, then one would declare that, you know, you are diabetic and you have to take uh, medicine for diabetes. So now it means that, you know, that those beta cells over time was telling something that, you know, they, are, they were compromised over time. It doesn't happen in a year or two. It, it is a progressive thing. So what we are going to look at in today's few slides that how vitamin D, uh, you know, is involved in the management of this condition. So let me share my screen with you. So the first slide you're seeing here is titled by beta cell functions by treatment groups. So they took the entire group and divided into two groups. One was treated with vitamin D and one with placebo. Placebo is like uh, giving a sweet pill, has no therapeutic effect at all. So if you see uh, on the y-axis, we have a beta cell function uh, in terms of MI, o, MI, M over I ratio. Uh, it means that you know the amount of glucose, MI is amount of glucose metabolized for the amount of insulin it requires. So, uh, this is this is a measure of beta cell function. So if person who was you know the group uh, population was treated with vitamin D, uh, they their MI ratio from beta cells function from 0 0.0062 it raises to 0 0.0077. That's a 24% increase. Whereas the placebo group did see the change, but the, the increase was not that pronounced. Now, this effect is only over six months. Remember that. So this, this, this state of the condition of diabetes, which we call in the form of insulin resistance, 
it doesn't happen over uh, six months or a year period. It is a long progressive you know, uh, condition. And one would remain in prediabetes, as I said earlier, or borderline prediabetes for a number of you know, years before that person turns into, if it gets unnoticed, before that person gets noticed by the doctor that excess blood sugar is there, uh, and that person is declared as a diabetes. So now there are some tests, marker tests, which I will be discussing later on when I will be discussing that what kind of test I do for myself and my family on a yearly basis to monitor that, you know, how insulin sensitive we are and we are not in that camp of being insulin resistant. So HbA1c, which we know of, and uh, fasting blood sugar, those are good parameters, but that's not the 100% accurate. And we will discuss when we will discuss the testing. So uh, next slide is if you look at type, type two diabetes by risk level with vitamin D. Now, if you look at here, uh, they have kept uh, one as a reference for all people between 20 to 29 nanograms per milliliter. So that's reference one as a 1.0 as a reference. Now, if somebody was less than 20 nanograms per milliliter in their vitamin D status in the blood serum, they were exposed to 25% risk higher than the reference. So it means that the lower the D, your, you remember that, you know, what happens that, you know, your beta cells in pancreas receives this raw material from vitamin D. So over time, if you do deprive your beta cells from raw material of vitamin D as a hormone, uh, then your beta cells are not going to function and they're going to die over time. So they're not going to function the way they are supposed to and send the insulin for the rescue of excess blood sugar to send to the cellular level. Now, if somebody was in the range of 30 to 39 nanograms per milliliter, they had a 2% lower risk. But if somebody was between 40 to 49 nanograms per milliliter, there were 43% lower in risk category than the reference level. But if somebody maintained 50 plus nanograms per milliliter, means 50 above, then their risk level was 65% lower from the reference. So you see that you know vitamin D is a one major player, uh, you know, uh, in in you know insulin resistance management. Now, this is not a silver bullet, as I've been saying in all my vlogs. You know, this is the basic, basic fundamental thing. But you know, normally it's considered that you know, uh, you know, people eat sweets that turns into diabetic. No, that's not true. That worsens the condition, but that's not the true cause of. Uh, one becoming a diabetic. So we will talk a little bit more in detail that, you know, what it entails and what kind of a special test uh, I personally do, uh, you know, for as a marker test to check uh, that, you know, how insulin sensitive we are and, you know, are we in the camp of insulin sensitivity or in the camp of insulin resistant? Uh, let's look at this next slide. Uh, and this is exactly uh, what I was talking about, that you know, two groups were divided into this uh, treatment group. One was with vitamin D uh, baseline, and uh, you know, green is a baseline. And uh, uh, after six months, the blue is after six months results. So one group was treated with vitamin D, and one was given a placebo pill. Uh, so the insulin sensitivity, uh, you can see that, you know, at a baseline, the per, the group people uh, in in that category who were treated uh, with vitamin D as a baseline, they were three point nine seven. But after six months uh, with supplement vitamin D and bringing their vitamin D level high enough, uh, so that insulin sensitivity uh, response increased by four point eight eight. That's a that's a twenty three percent increase. Now in the placebo group as expected that you know nothing was done with vitamin d of course the you know the insulin sensitivity went down means person is getting getting closer to being insulin resistant over time not overnight not in a month or not in a year but over time so 
it, it's it's not a good marker. Uh, it's not a good indicator that you know person is in stayed in. The next one is the relationship with vitamin D level compared to HbA1c, hemoglobin A1c. Uh, which is three months status of our blood sugar report, blood glucose report, uh, that how we are doing in the last 90 days. Uh, and if you look at it, you know, this is in type one diabetic adolescents. Uh, if you look at this uh, relationship, this uh, best fitted curve in various data population, that, you know, it has a negative fitted slope line. So it means that it varies inversely. So the lower the vitamin D, the higher the HbA1c. And if, if you recall that, you know, the cutoff line for, uh, you know, uh, pre-diabetes is, uh, I would say, around 5.6, 5.7. And, and anything above 5.7 to 6.2, I believe. Um, don't quote me on it. You know, I recall vaguely, but we will talk detail uh, when we will talk, talk about the testing. But uh, if you see here, the whole idea is that, you know, the lower the vitamin D, uh, greater the uh, HbA1c is going to be over time. So that's not a good sign. So let me stop share here. And uh, what I'm doing right now uh, over time in the previous vlogs that I'm sharing each non-communicable diseases with you in relation to how it, it relates to the vitamin D deficiency. Uh, and over time, uh, how it can improve or how it can mitigate the risk uh, of being in one of the camp of non-communicable diseases, God forbid, if somebody has it. All we can do is try from our level the best we can. And, and, and you know, as I said in the earlier sessions, that vitamin D is one of the, one of the tool uh, besides many, of course, we will talk more about diet and all that that you know, what kind of a uh, different test and diet one should have to have a regular checkup and you know, what one can expect. Uh, hopefully next time I will talk to you uh, on uh, the neurological disorders uh, in relation to vitamin D level deficiency. Uh, until then, see you. Mm -hmm.